Hi, I'm Raleigh Astronomy Club co-chair Doug Lively, and welcome to a Raleigh Astronomy Club virtual meeting. Tonight's presentation is on amateur stellar spectroscopy and will be given by Matt Lachansky. Matt has been a Raleigh Astronomy Club member for many years and is an avid follower of stellar spectroscopy. Tonight, Matt will demonstrate how amateur astronomers can get involved in stellar spectroscopy, what to expect from spectroscopy images and data, and how you can get started in this fascinating aspect of amateur astronomy. We join Matt's presentation already in progress. Uh, millions of stars up there, and pretty much they've all been classified, but they can change over time. Um, and actually, they change more than you might realize. Over the long scale, you can see stars. This is your um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, HR diagram. You know, most stars follow this line right here. Right, this is your classical curve where stars start hot and over time they fade. This is over the course of, you know, billions of years. Um, our star is kind of in the, the back end of this uh, as a type G star. I guess it's right here. <clears throat> Most stars are class M. About 76% of the stars that we know are, are type M stars. And they can range within each of these classes It'll be at M uh, zero through nine, and then there's other uh, notations that can go along with that. Hot stars are O stars, um, and then it goes all the way down uh, B, A. A are uh, your, your best stars for starting out with a spectroscopy, and we'll show you why. Um, only 0.6% of the population are A stars, but you'll see that uh, they seem to be very prevalent in our skies, at least for the stars we can see, because you have to remember they're brighter than a type M. So comparing the, the types of stars, this uh, chart shows a, a type O at the top, and it goes all the way down to type M. And you can see that the spectral lines come in and fade out. So I want you to focus on this hydrogen beta line right here. So this is 4861 angstrom. It's a very diagnostic band. And you can see, you can see it in the type O star, but it becomes really bright or really dark, most defined in a type A. And then it starts to fade, fade out until by the time you're down to a, a G type star, it's a very faint line. And then not even present below that. And on the flip side, something like helium becomes much more prevalent down here. You can see that you get a lot more of these, these heavier elements as you get to cooler stars, K, M, and zero, and uh, M0 and M2. And that's not to say that there isn't hydrogen and helium there, but the temperature doesn't allow that, that same excitation of the electrons, so you don't see that band as prominently. All right, so let's get into the equipment a little bit. Um, so I talk about high resolution and low resolution, and this talk's gonna focus mostly on low resolution. And in particular, I use this guy right here. This is called a Star Analyzer 100, and it's 100 because the grading that's in here um, is 100 lines per millimeter. And that's just a, a measure of how much it's going to disperse light. Um, 100 is it's pretty low. Um, you'll see that this guy here, this is a reflective grading, uh, 600 lines per millimeter. So its dispersion is six times as much. And dispersion isn't resolution, but in general, the, you know, if you have more lines, you have more dispersion and higher resolution, but it comes at a cost because the more you disperse your light, the more you need to collect. And it's very difficult um, to catch dimmer stars when you're spreading the light out by that much more. Another difference that you'll find with uh, high resolution versus low resolution is um, a slit. So uh, most, um, if you look, remember my stellar spectra, it, the, li the lines were all in uh, vertical bands. And that's because th that, that light was coming through a slit. It, it means the, um, how do I explain it? So the light is not coming in all at once and, and from different angles and, and 
coming over itself. It's literally just a strip of light that's getting spread out over, uh, over space uh, as it approaches the camera detector. Um, that's how you get high resolution because you're not measuring both sides of an object. And you'll see an example of that in a little bit. Um, I do want to point out that I decided to put this up here. There's a lot of commercial um, spectroscopes out there from medium to high resolution, but this is the low spec. Um, I know I posted it on our group's uh, page about this not long ago, uh, maybe about three months ago, but this is a 3D printed spectroscope complete with the full directions and what you need to order to make it work. So if anyone's looking to build a, a, a medium to high resolution spectroscope, um, you can 3D print it and, and the parts essentially feed right into it. You can see that this grating here fits right into this holder and it gets just sent right down into the, the right spot in here. It should be just about collimated after you do it once and you're ready to go. It's, um, it's pretty neat. Um, it'll still cost probably about $1,000 to build, but um, it's an interesting little project, I have to say. But again, we're going to focus on this Star Analyzer 100. So I got started um, about nine years ago doing spectroscopy. And this is what I got started with. So you don't need a big telescope. You don't need, um, you know, a fancy mount. My rule of thumb is that if you can do video astronomy with it, you can do spectroscopy. This is a C8 mounted on a CG5. Um, I have my, my moonlight uh, focuser. And at the end here, this is the Stellacam, which is like one of those little uh, security cameras. Um, it's been passed around the club a little bit. If anyone wants to borrow it, they're, they're welcome to it. Um, it has some limitations. It can only, uh, its maximum exposure is eight seconds. Um, and you also need a, uh, a video conversion card digital capture card to collect the data. But it works, it, it's a great little uh, tool for video astronomy, and it was a great way to get started in um, amateur spectroscopy. Um, I show you this because most of my data that I'm gonna present later was taken with this setup eight, nine years ago. Um, this is my rig now. So, you know, I have all these upgrades, right? So I now have the CGEM and a C11, um, I'm guiding. Instead of that, uh, the, camera, the security camera, I now have an ATIC 314L, which is a mono camera. Um, and the biggest thing is that I put this filter wheel in and I actually was doing an experiment during the virtual rack OBS um, two weeks ago, where I was like, well, I put, the, put that star analyzer in line and so it's literally just one of those filter spots and see what happens. And I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but it, it performed pretty well. Um, and after a little bit of collimation the next day, I was able to collect some data. And that's what we're going to go through in just a little bit. But what I want to want to point out is that um, what I found was that my resolute, not my resolution, my dispersion is the same between the two setups. So I'm not gaining any resolution. I'm not really gaining much of anything other than a bigger telescope that collects a little bit more light. Um, and you know, it's not that much more light. 89% more light gathering power doesn't equate to that much more when we're talking about stellar magnitudes, especially when you're now taking that light and you know, through the, uh, you're, you're, you're diffracting it into different uh, parts of your sensor. So this is uh, some typical star data. Um, this is my data. I collected this uh, a number of years ago. This is what it looks like. We're going to go through a full example in a minute here, but you can see that I have a star and then it, it generates this uh, smear of light out here. Now, if you look closely, you can kind of see the banding in here. And very quickly, you realize that this is going to be a type A star because it's got these hydrogen absorption lines. There's your hydrogen alpha, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera. On the flip side, this is Betelgeuse. Um, I don't have a picture of the, of the um, spectra here, but you can see that it's got much more, many more features. It's not nearly as uh, uniform as, as the red line is. Um, and you can also see that this one goes up. So it has very little um, at the back end here and more, more at this side. So this is more red 
whereas Vega is more blue. Um, before I get started with this, are there any questions that we want to address? So Matt, it's Doug. We don't really have any any uh, any questions in the chat window. Uh, just give me a second, and I'll open up everyone, and I'll unmute everyone. And then, uh, if you've got a question, don't hesitate to uh, uh, to answer. I did. I just have gotten uh, one question in chat, and it is, what type of software are you using for the grab? Right. So that is a program called RSpec, and um, I'm going to have a link to that later. There are uh, three or four different good options. Uh, RSpec is the paid option. Um, I think it's $100 for the license. Um, I, I know the guy who, who has built it. He does a lot of work with the school, so I'm happy to support him. And it's also, in my opinion, uh, a, a very user-friendly uh, tool. You can learn to use it in less than a night, and you're up and running. Great, thanks, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna unmute everybody if you wanna ask a question. You may need to individually unmute your mics to ask. Okay, doesn't look like we have any questions for now. Why don't you go ahead and I'll mute everybody and then uh, we'll, um, let me just give me, a, give me a moment. I need to unmute everybody and then unmute you, Matt. All right, there you go. All right, great. Yeah, I wanted to take a break there because that kind of uh, sums up uh, the more, I guess, theoretical, the, the, the less exciting part, in my opinion, of the talk. Um, and now we're going to get into what I actually do um, to make this all work. Um, I mentioned that I, I had that new setup with the filter wheel, and so I was able to collect some data. This was the Saturday after Rack Ops that I actually collected this. Um, um, I went out, I made sure my scope was collimated. I hadn't done a lot of things. And so this was actually, this is the raw data that came out of uh, my first acquisition. So what you're looking at here, this was in the area of the Big Dipper. And those two stars in the middle are Mizar A and B. The streak you see to the bottom left is Alcor's spectra. Um, one thing with generating spectra, much like astrophotography, it's really sensitive to exposure times. So you can see this is Mizar A and B, here's your spectra. And you can see Mizar A, um, I think it's about a magnitude brighter than B, and it is completely smeared out. They're both A-type stars. You can see a little bit of, uh, of features in here, but not as much as you should see. This is overexposed whereas the one beneath it is, uh, is a really good exposure level. You want it to be bright enough where you have, you're collecting a lot of data and dim enough where you're not saturating any pixels. Um, and that is a little bit of trial and error and it can vary night to night depending on seeing conditions, sky brightness, um, and a whole host of other factors. So, I mean, it is, it is much like astrophotography where you're trying to figure out exposure times, you do need some trial and error. But once you practice, you kind of get the hang of it. Um, with my software, what I'm able to do is I'm able to take this and say, okay, well, here's my image and I can essentially put bars around it. And I say, okay, I only want to catch this bottom one and it'll draw some lines horizontally across here and it knows to collect my data from between those two lines, and I can tell it to also do some background subtraction um, either above or below. And you notice that there are some other, other lines and things in here. Um, I'll show you those in a, in a little bit here. So very raw, after I uh, do that import and I uh, subtract the background, this is what I get. So you remember that the star was not in the middle of the, uh, was about in the middle of the frame um, it wasn't at the left side, right? So I have all, the, all these wasted pixels here. Uh, this is where the Star Analyzer 200, there's a, another version, SA200, and that would give me uh, twice the dispersion. 
Um, I think in, in my setup, it might be a, a good tool, but it's not something that I currently own. Um, so I'm stuck with this. This is good though. So we say that this is the stars here and here's the spectrum. And what's really nice is um, I took an, a spectrum of an A type star. So I know what these bands are. And so when you're starting for the night and you don't know what your resolute, what your dispersion is for the night, you really want to start with knowns. And so we know that this is the hydrogen beta peak, which is 4861 angstroms. And I know that the star is zero. So I can now apply a correction to this that will convert my pixels to angstroms. And when I do that, I can now uh, crop my image and I say the star is at zero and here's my spectrum. And actually I don't need the star anymore. I can just go and look at the spectrum now. Okay, so we did this two point and we found that my uh, dispersion, my, I say resolution here, resolution is a little bit of a different term, to be 13 angstroms per, per pixel. So for every data point I have on here, it's about 13 angstroms of wavelength. So that's like my bucket. Um, my resolution using that math is about 500. So it's definitely low resolution, but it means that I have um, the ability to go down to, you know, 10th magnitude stars probably without too much trouble. Hey Matt, it's Doug. Um, one of the uh, questions that was asked on the chat from, uh, from Barton is, is that more dispersion means wider spread. So is there more possible resolution? So it's a trade-off. Um, so the more you uh, uh, spread out your light, the dimmer it becomes, right? Because you're, you're, you're sharing the same amount of light across more pixels. Um, on the flip side, you do get, you can get better resolution, but the difference isn't great. I mean, with, with that kind of setup, you're not gonna be doing high or medium resolution work. It's, it's just not set up for that. So my rule of thumb is I try to get it to 10 to 15 angstroms per pixel. Um, I was surprised. Um, this was the first time I ran it using the filter wheel and it actually turned out to be the exact same as what I had with the old, um, with the old setup, um, which did not have a filter wheel. Um, it, it, uh, the grading is a screw on filter, just like any other screw on filter would be. Um, and then I have some spacers. So I was actually spacing it uh, by 40 millimeters and just coincidentally, it turns out to be the same distance. Um, I was very pleased by that. So my data that I'm collecting now is very comparable to what I was collecting using the old setup seven, eight years ago. Does that answer the question? I think it did, um, but there is another question. And so that is, is that really kind of three parts to it. First of all, what kind of exposure time are you using for this particular um, uh, screen that you have here? versus if you were to lengthen your exposure time, would you, uh, would that compensate for the lower resolution? Um, yes, and very good questions, and I'm gonna get to them. But I do wanna point out um, that, that this particular um, sample here was a one second exposure, and this Mizar B is a visual magnitude of 3.88 according to the source I found. Um, I think it was through a Simbad search. I'm not sure where they get their data from. So we'll get, we'll get to the other half of that question in just a minute though. Um, and this was unguided. I was not guiding um, when I did this, but for one second or even 10 seconds, you don't really need it. Um, okay, so we got our star, we got our spectrum. Um, and we got our dispersion factor, 13.03. And what's really nice about this number here is once I go to the next star, which let's say it's a type M star, that's not gonna have these clearly defined peaks. Well, I can now use my 13.03 and essentially do a one point calibration. I say this is the star and the, and the uh, number is 13.03 and it'll automatically convert my pixels to angstroms. Um, you know, it, it it works for this application and it is perfectly scientifically valid. Um, so it's really nice. 
All right, so I have my uh, spectrum, but now I need to correct my spectrum for the instrument response. So all cameras, color, mono, they all react to different wavelengths of light um, differently, and they're mostly tuned towards green. And you can generate these instrument response curves once you create it for a given camera, you're good to go. You don't need to recreate it. You can just keep using it over and over and over again. Um, with the one caveat being that if you're looking at something that's um, you know lower on the horizon or something like that, you know your your extinction coefficients may be different. Um, you know the light may just be um, coming at you a little bit differently, and you might need to adjust your your spectrum. But I've never needed to. This, these are low resolution, and it is so forgiving, and that's why it's a great way for amateurs to to contribute some scientific data. Um, so instrument response curve, really quickly, the way I generate this is I take a known star and I take my, my data and I literally divide the two to get this instrument response curve. And then once I have that, I can divide that by the raw spectrum, right? And then magically, we get our finished spectrum. So my finished spectrum is in red here. You can see the dips for the hydrogen peaks, these are the expected wavelengths. Um, and in blue is actually a reference spectrum. So uh, the, the software I'm using, RSpec, has these built-in um, libraries that are, actually they're, they're low to mid-resolution libraries, which is really nice. Um, and it shows what an A2 star should look like. And you can see that the data matches up wonderfully. So this is a great example, um, some really good stuff here. Um, there's a little dip here that you'll notice. So you do have atmospheric effects and this is atmospheric oxygen. It's called a telluric line. Um, and there's a few of them, a lot of these dips in here. I don't think the data is really useful after like 7,500 angstroms, but I do like to report it out typically to 8,500 just to show it. It's personal preference. Um, if you ever wanted to submit this data, every source has different guidelines for submitting. So if we take that same field and we expose it for 10 seconds, this is now what we get. So there's so much to point out in here. Um, the first thing is you'll notice that our Mizar A and B are both blown out. You know, there's no useful data. So you can see that, you know, you really do have to pay attention to exposure. Um, you'll also notice these lines to the left. And so most of these gratings are blazed gratings. And what that means is that it shifts most of the light to what's called the first order spectrum. So that is over here, but there's also a negative first order. And that is this guy over here. If you were to look way out even further, you might find a second order spectrum. So you have to be a little careful to know what you're looking at. Um, the dispersion will be different for the second, third, fourth orders, but the negative one and one should be the same. Just know that a blaze grading is gonna push all the light to here and you really should use it. Um, Alcor is all blown out, but what was really nice when I did the 10 second is I have this other star here. It was just barely visible on the original. And, and now you can see that I have a spectrum. And so I was like, well, let's, Let's go, let's, uh, let's process this spectrum right here. And so I don't know what this star is. Um, I made a point of not looking. I just went and processed it. Um, and you can see that uh, very quickly, I was able to, to see very strong hydrogen absorption lines. So even though those A stars are only 0.6% um, of all the stars that we know of, uh, Mizar A and B are A type. I believe Alcor is A type. And this star that I found is also A type. And, uh, you know, I knew where I was looking, so I was able to solve it. It's this star called Stella Ludovisiana. I thought that was a really cool star name, so I <laughs> wanted to include it. Um, its visual magnitude is 7.58. So this is about 40 times dimmer than Mizar B. So, um, you can see it's a little bit noisier. Um, you can stack images. Uh, there's all kinds of tools you can do to get better spectra. Um, this was one night that I was just messing around with this stuff. 
Um, but I was quite impressed. Uh, 7.58, you can go dimmer. Um, you certainly could get down to a 10th magnitude um, star, probably without guiding, um, and probably even more than that if you wanted to add guiding in there. Um, by the way, this star should be an A5 type. So before I get into some other spectra, I wanted to, to just kind of take a step back and, and go through a little bit of my timeline in spectroscopy, because um, I've learned some really good lessons. Um, I started collecting spectroscopic data fall of 2011. It took one night to get my first spectrum. So I'm telling you that this is not hard to do. If you have any experience in astrophotography or video astronomy, this is, this is just using a different filter. So, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to help people get started as well. Super. Hey, Matt, uh, Doug, if we could just pause just for a second. There are a few questions sure. uh, that I'd like to see if we can uh, uh, get those answered. Um, I think that that's what, well, what's a little unclear is actually how you actually submit this data. You, I think you captured this, this data on a sensor. How is that actually sent to your, your graph? How are you actually submitting that? I think that's a, a little unclear. Um, yeah, so it's, I'm literally loading in the image file. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah, it's literally, I, I'm opening the file as if I was opening an image file. Mm -hmm. um, and then my software has some, has some tools in it to um, create those lines that, that extract just the spectrum I want. Okay, so the, software knows how, so the software knows how, once you open the image file, the software knows how to go in, look for a spectral image, and how to process the lines, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't even need to be a spectral image. It just, it literally maps um, how bright every pixel is across the line. Mm -hmm. that you tell it to integrate yeah okay and so um we have um a teacher uh who's basically saying that they're uh they're talking about spectra this week um they're just kind of wondering if you'd be interested in sharing the slides i think maybe i can connect you with uh with with that teacher maybe after after the meeting and everything sure thing and then uh, one, one question is is that um uh, are there blue lines um included in this um blue lines. So um, in the spectrum, you know, as you go out to higher wavelengths, this is your red data. And to the left is your is your blue. Mm -hmm. um, this is just the standard way of displaying spectral data. Okay. And um, then, oh, the, the, are you talking about the actual blue lines? Here? Yeah, these actual vertical blue lines. Oh. That's what your software adds. Yeah, my software does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'll be happy to give a demo of the software too, if anyone yeah. wants. Sure. Um, you know, we can set that up as a side project sometime. Okay. Um, and actually, the if you ever go to, it's rspec-astro.com. He has a ton of tutorials on his website. Okay. And uh, so, again, so uh, were you able to identify the star based on the spectra, or, is, or did you just go to, to the, posi the, to the uh, a position where it was at in your star chart to understand what the name of the star was? So the way that I did it, because um, I wanted to challenge myself, um, was I identified it as a type A something star. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I was pretty confident it was a type A spectral type. And then I, I looked um, around and I found a star that was a type A that would be exactly where I'd expected it, about the right brightness. So I kind of, there aren't too many stars around there. So there's really only one that it could be, to be honest. But I wanted to identify the spectral type first and then use it mm -hmm. as a confirmation. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much. All right. That's great. Thank you. That's, all right. Yeah, please continue. Okay. So my lessons learned. I started this, like I said, about eight and a half years ago. Um, very easy to get started. I did this for about six months. Um, I think I gave a talk to the club um, in the spring of 2012 as well um, about the work I was doing. I was so gung ho on it. It was great. And I was, I was so excited because I was, uh, I just signed up to get one of these L200s, which um, it was only available through this Yahoo group called Astronomical Spectroscopy, uh, which is owned by Ken Harrison, who's very active in the amateur astronomy or amateur spectroscopy groups. 
Um, and he build he was building these batches, um, you know, like 20 of them at a time um, in his garage somewhere, I think in, it's not in the UK, somewhere in Europe. Um, and I was, he was literally selling them for parts. Um, and it was, it was great. Very excited about it. I got it. I put it together. Um, but I knew that when, if I was going from a hundred millimeter, hundred lines per millimeter to 600 or 1200, that I was going to have that much more dispersion and going to need that much more light collection. And on, on top of that, that's a slit spectroscope. So you have to be able to, to get your star on a slit and keep it there for, in this case, you know, you're talking about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or longer, depending on how bright the star is. So it can be quite challenging. You have to be a really good astrophotographer to be able to do that. Um, and guiding is a whole different challenge with that as well. Um, <clears throat> so I needed a better camera. <laughs> I needed to upgrade my telescope. I needed to do guiding and I needed to upgrade the mount because there was all that extra weight. Um, in the end, I, I really got, I wouldn't say good at astrophotography, but I got better. Um, and I can produce a, a reasonable um, image, um, but I never ended up connecting that L200 to the telescope. It was just too difficult. Um, the L200 itself is kind of heavy and it had to be almost permanently mounted. Otherwise you had flexure issues. So start simple, keep it simple, um, and, and don't, don't rush to go to higher resolution. Um, when you go to higher resolution also, it's not as forgiving. And the people who are reviewing high res data, they, they're they just not as, uh, they're more in the expert field. Um, and they want things a certain way. So I would, you know, my advice, keep it as a hobby and, uh, you know, stick to low resolution until you can't bear not to anymore. Um, and so that's that's the best advice I can give on on low resolution spectroscopy. And I'm excited to be getting back into it because there really is a wealth of things you can do low resolution. So the data you saw before this was data I collected two weeks ago, and that was the first time I had really observed anything and, and processed the data in eight years. So um, I have really enjoyed doing some astrophotography when I can. I'm not the most active and you know I have, I tend to not get my telescope out as often as I should. But um, in any case, the data you're gonna see now was taken eight years ago, and hopefully it explains some of the other things that I've talked about. So this is a spectra of a planetary nebula. This is the Eskimo Nebula. And so if you remember, we were talking about slit spectroscopes versus non-slit. And you can see an object like the uh, Eskimo Nebula or, or any other, you know, planetary or uh, if you wanted to try a galaxy, uh, you know, that's just a collection of stars. But you can see that they're not points of light anymore and they take up more pixels. And so the pixels all get kind of mixed, matched across when they get spread. So you can see your, your, in your spectrum here, you've got an extended area here and it correlates to this right here. So it's interesting the way it works. Um, <clears throat> you can still map these just the same. Just know that your resolution isn't very good because um, it's an extended object. Um, in this case, we got something right at 5,000 angstroms, which is uh, the O3 line. So, you know, if you're, if you want to observe the Eskimo Nebula, uh, perhaps you want to use an O3 filter because it's the brightest in O3. Um, here's your hydrogen alpha as well. So again, these are emission spectra because this isn't uh, a black body that's coming through the nebula. You're actually looking at light that's being reflected from another star. Um, one of my favorite things, and there's very active campaigns to, to monitor shell stars. Um, shell stars are mostly B-type stars that have an accretion disk around them. And you can see a diagram of it here. And this, this uh, accretion disk is moving. So based on the speed in which this is moving, um, it will make the emission line brighter or darker, or 
brighter. It'll make it wider or narrower. Um, and you can compare them to see the, the relative speed. Even at low resolution, you can do that. Because um, you do have to remember that the Doppler shift is uh, in effect here, right? So if, if you're looking here, if, you, if your camera is here, if it's going this way, it's, it's red shifted, this way blue shifted. Um, and you and you get these, uh, if it was higher resolution, you'd actually see two points. Um, your other hydrogen emissions are here because you're still seeing the absorption through the star. Just the HA is is uh, is lit up. You can see a little bit here. You can see a little bit of that brightened pixel. Uh, and then there's all kinds of really exotic stars out there. You know, we talked about main sequence stars, um, but this is a carbon star. Um, and it has all these, uh, what are called swan bands. These are all C2s, and you see uh, CNs down here. And here's, here's a telluric band for oxygen. Um, let me tell you, if you see the spectrum for this, it's pretty amazing too. Um, it just has all these bands uh, all through it. You can see a synthesized spectrum down here. Um, this is a, the program does this. This isn't real data. But look at that. Can you imagine seeing that where it's got these you know, alternating patterns? It, it, they're amazing. And then this, is a, this was super lucky that, you know, I had just started this stuff. And in the, the fall of 2011, there was a really bright supernova. I think it got as high as a visual magnitude of about nine and a half, um, which is really bright. Um, you can see Emma 101. If you look in the background here, you can see it right here. Um, I happened to catch this just right. This was probably two, three weeks after I started, and I was able to nab a spectrum of this. Um, when in doing so, uh, I proved that it's a type 1A supernova. You can see the this silicon band here is really the determinator of that. And what's really interesting, um, now I was new. I, I I still don't know if I could do this myself, but um, this peak here should be at 6355 angstroms, but I observed it at 6110. And so that means that it's, it's uh, Doppler shifted. And you can apply the Doppler equation to figure out what speed that ejecta is coming out of that supernova. And in this case, I measured at 11,500 kilometers per second. So and that just shows how violent a supernova uh, really can be. Um, this data here almost made it into Sky and Telescope. Apparently we missed the deadline by about two days. Um, quite disappointed by that, but it did make it into uh, Astronomy Technology Today. I don't remember the uh, the the episode, uh, which, uh, mag which um, what the date of the magazine was, but there's a reprint of it here. Uh, we, we'll find a way to get these slides passed around. Yeah. So Matt, there is a question about that that particular slide. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, is uh, and one question is is that uh, were you able to determine how far away the star was, and did that actually affect the the redshift? Um, so the short answer is photometry is what's typically used because a Type One A supernova is a standard candle. Um, I was not measuring photometry, so I couldn't tell the distance. Um, so there are measurements. I don't know the exact number, but I know people did measure the distance based on that supernova. I will say that um, I haven't covered it yet. I'll, I'll cover it a little bit more later. But for something like a supernova, you know, a lot of the times the big uh, telescopes, they can go and they can observe something like this really briefly. Um, you have to have some pull to do it. But typically for something like this, yeah, the big telescopes might go and do a quick observation, but they're not going to be observing this over the course of um, hours and days and months. And that's where the amateurs really come in, is a supernova, a nova, a lot of these transient uh, phenomena, they, they play out over the course of days and months. And telescope time is booked longer than that in advance. So amateurs really fill in the gap of, of showing how these things evolve spectroscopically. Um, there was a really good example that I was following of um, a Nova and Delphinius probably about seven years ago. And they had all these really interesting uh, animations showing spectral change over time. And it was all done by amateurs. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I did want to cover the solar system really quick because you can take a spectrum of Uranus or Neptune for that matter. Um, and you apply your instrument correction, but then you also subtract your sun, your solar spectrum, a G2V spectrum. And uh, you do that because most of the light you're seeing from Uranus and Neptune is reflected from our sun. In fact, all of it is, um, but it leaves these absorption bands. And in this case, we were able to identify nep um, ammonia and methane um, on the, you know, coming, this is light from the sun that's hitting the planet and bouncing back to us. And we're able to observe really, you know, chemicals that are there, not just atoms, but actual chemicals. I thought that was pretty interesting. Really an experiment everyone has to do if they get into it. So I talked briefly earlier, a few minutes ago about Pro-Am collaborations. There's always ones going on. Um, you know, I think through most of the early 2000s, the, you know, the professional amateur, uh, professional astronomers kind of turned their noses up at, at amateurs. And then they realized that, especially with the improvements in cameras, that we can produce some really nice work. And so there's quite a few uh, primary investigators who actively seek out um, amateur spectroscopists to, to monitor these phenomena because they don't really care where the data comes from. They're not collecting it. They just want to, you know, be able to, to figure out what, what physics is happening at that point in time. And they need more data to do it. Um, and telescope time is expensive and, and rare. So if it's something amateurs can do, they're, they're all for it. Um, this is an example of ones that were going on, I think, late last year. Um, and there's always more, tons of resources on the web, um, a lot of people. Um, I will say that the US crowd is a little bit thin. Um, most of the people seem to be in Europe. So one other question, Matt, is uh, have you uh, tried any galaxies with this? Um, for fun, I did. Um, a galaxy is really just a collection of stars. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like looking at a spectroscopic double star. Um, where you're essentially seeing two spectra overlaid on top of each other, but then try a galaxy where you're looking at, you know, 300 million stars. Yeah. Something crazy like that. Um, and you really can't get anything useful out of it. Um, sometimes you can get, uh, I've seen people try and guess at the age of a galaxy based on that, because, uh, you know, a younger galaxy is going to have more um, hot, you know, type a stars type O stars, but, I haven't, I haven't seen anything really good come out of uh, one of those studies. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And then just to wrap up um, some of my processing software. Um, so RSpec is the one that I use. Um, like I said, I think it's about a hundred dollars uh, and that license is good for several years. If he comes out with like a major version, he's done it once in the, in the nine years I've been doing this. Um, Really nice guy, and he does a lot of educational work. Um, he sells educational kits. He's got some uh, some nice stuff. He's he's really good at explaining stuff. Um, uh, his name is Tom Field, the guy that runs this, and and he actually is happy to give presentations as well. So if we ever wanted to invite him to a club meeting, hear him talk instead of me, um, that would certainly be possible. I could arrange that. And then there's some others out there. VSpec. Um, uh, you know, it's someone's pet project, but um, a lot of people use it. And this ISIS is also really popular. These are both uh, free uh, pieces of software. Um, I think they're not as easy to use, but everything has a learning curve. So Matt, there's a question about this from Ian, uh, and that is that uh, the, um, is there um, uh, some software that you can use to generate a, a synthetic spectral curve to identify things like surface temp? Repeat that. What was the end of that? So is there some software that you can use to generate a synthetic spectral curve to identify things like effective surface temperature? Well, you can use reference spectra. Um, I don't know about synthesized though. Um, I don't know, maybe one of the other tools has it. Our spec has a lot of reference spectra. Um, so you know what, you know, for example, if you pulled up a G2V and compared it to our star, you know, you might be able to compare them, but, um, 
At the low resolution level, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll tell what you what, I'm, I'm going to unmute Ian just for a moment. And Ian, if you want to, uh, to um, provide some further. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry, yeah. we, let, we let him on here? Do what? No. I, <laughs> I don't let anybody on here. Right? <laughs> um, no, I was just curious because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's common. Uh, one of the things that, that people do to identify some uh, characteristics of stars is you can actually generate a synthetic spectral line um, and, you know, compare it against the spectral line that you have. And you, you can kind of, like, look at, like, how wide the lines are. And I, I didn't know, I know that's somewhere that falls in between that sort of amateur and pro range. And I just didn't know if there was uh, some software that amateurs were using to do that. Yeah, I've never even heard that being done. Because, you know, there's, when, when you're dealing with something that's slitless, there's so many extra variables that go into that, that width. I'm not sure. But I'll have to look that up. Right, they usually you usually get to play with a lot of those variables, and you can to kind of guess. It's just a, it's it's just kind of like a fun little project. I, I just didn't know if there was a something that that amateurs were using. So, yeah, not that I know of. Okay, I, I've taken a step back. I haven't, you know, I I read one list and that's it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Ian. Okay, sorry. No, appreciate it. All right, there so um, there's another question, and that's can you use uh, can you use something like this to analyze the uh, the spectra or of, of exoplanets? They have atmosphere, uh, but uh, I guess maybe you need a larger telescope. Um, would you like to elaborate uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, I imagine you would need a, a much larger telescope. Um, I mean, a lot of those, uh, yeah. Um, I think if you get below 10th magnitude, 12th magnitude, you probably are going to be struggling. Um, and the, it would also have to be pretty well separated from the parent star. Otherwise, you're just going to get the spectrum of the parent star. Um, I think also a lot of the times they're, they're using closer to infrared spectra to, to look at those uh, yeah. exoplanets. But I could be wrong about that as well. OK. All right. Go ahead, uh, okay. all, all the questions for now. All right, well, I think I got two slides left, so we're almost done. Um, this is the, like I said, these are the, the softwares I use. And then here's my list of resources. Um, again, that astronomical spectroscopy group, um, I think they've now completely moved off Yahoo groups. Uh, a lot of those groups are much slower to move than, than we were. Um, it's a great resource. Um, you'll find people posting everything about tips and tricks and uh, to, you know, notifications about things that you might want to observe. Um, so like those astronomical telegraphs or whatever they're called, they, they uh, come through there pretty quick. So if you're ever out and happen to get one of those, sometimes you can be the first one to type a supernova. Um, believe it or not, it, it, it does not happen as quick as you think. Um, some books. Um, this uh, Spectral Atlas for Amateur Astronomers um, by Walker. That used to be a free resource, a PDF. I still have that um, if anyone wants it, but he has turned it into a book. Um, you can get that on Amazon or, or anywhere else. Um, that's really good for being in the field and starting to identify um, identify real data, like start figuring out what the, what the peaks and valleys are. Um, Kaler, Stars and Their Spectra, that's a good... Uh, book for, for typing stars, it is a, a theoretical book. And then uh, those two books by Ken Harrison, um, they're ones that I've had, they're short books, but they're really uh, useful information, uh, more observational than theory. Um, so really good to get started. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the, on the web, that ARAS forum, um, that's run by Christian Buell out of, uh, I forget where he is, uh, Germany, I'm tempted to say. Um, he's a very active uh, person in, in the amateur field. Uh, that astro Astronomer's Telegram, that's what I was talking about. That's where you can get your alerts about new things that are up there. Um, BE Stars, really popular, uh, and there's a database of those, and there's uh, some guidelines to submit to that, but they accept data from anyone um, and any resolution, um, provided you meet their criteria, right? Uh, the low spec that I talked about before, 
Um, and then uh, the star analyzer, I think it runs about $200. Um, so it's, you know, on the order of a narrow band filter. Um, uh, the 200 is a little bit more expensive than the 100, but, but they're both right about $200. Um, and it's also the same guy sells them in the US as that RSpec program. So, so that's my talk. Um, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert. Um, I just try and uh, try and learn what I can. And, you know, I, for me, being, you know, being a, a scientist first, uh, while I appreciate all the work that goes into astrophotography and making our pictures pretty, you know, what's, what's nice about spectroscopy for me is uh, you, you can't make it pretty. You have to use the data and treat it as data. And that means processing it as little as possible and just extracting the true values out of it. Okay. Uh, Matt, we do have one more question, and that is that um, how do LED lights on your driveway affect the signal? And you could also probably expand that to some of the general light pollution that we're seeing now. Yeah, so it's always signal to noise, um, just like in astrophotography or anything else. Um, what's nice is it's diffuse and it's it runs through that same uh, grading and gets just, you know uh, dispersed out through your spectrum. Um, it just it just raises the level of your background, so your 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 noise is higher, so you need more signal to compensate for it. Um, same thing anywhere else. Uh, you know, I, I I think the LEDs are a little bit more spectroscopy friendly than the um, sodium vapor lamps um, because they're a uniform, you know, uniform spectrum. Matt, thanks for an awesome presentation, and we hope you on the net enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to learn more about astronomy, check out our club website at www.raleighastro.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or check out our YouTube page, which contains lots of instructional videos that are free to watch. I'm your moderator, Doug Lively, wishing you all a good night and clear skies.